Um, so for those who are new to us, MedAct is an organisation that works with health workers to do research and evidence-based campaigning to challenge the root causes of global and public health inequalities. We work on issues ranging from climate change, peace and security, economic injustice and migration. Um, and like I said, I'm the lead on peace and security issues. So I support health workers to raise awareness about the health and socio-economic impacts of war, armed violence and weapons and their geopolitical root causes. More recently, in the past few years, probably like aligning with the pandemic, to be honest, we've been exploring the issue of the securitization of health with a particular focus on prevent and counter extremism, but we have also looked at and worked on broader issues within policing, um, within health services or supported by health services. Um, and yeah, so in 2020, we published our report, False Positives, the Prevent Counter Extremism Policy in Healthcare, which you can actually find over here. We've printed out some copies. Um, and it's a report detailing the implementation and impacts of Prevent in the NHS. Um, and last year, we followed that up with a report called Racism, Mental Health and Pre-Crime Policing, the Ethics of Vulnerability Support Hubs. And Tarek, who's here today, is actually one of the um, co-authors on that. Um, and you might hear a bit but more about that later. It's a police, it's a counter-terror police-led mental health project. Um, I'll just skip all that stuff. <laughs> so yeah, essentially we wanted to raise awareness of and resist healthcare being used as an arm of government policing, um, immigration and counter-terror agendas by becoming complicit in surveillance which is something that we seek to do within our Securitization of Health group, which is a group of uh, health workers, um, patients, obviously those two are not uh, separate things, um, but also academics and people more broadly affected by PREVENT, um, who come together to educate others about the impacts of PREVENT, but also about um, yeah, working to campaign to end PREVENT as a whole. Uh, yeah, so I'll just, we're here today for a very specific reason. So um, I'm very excited to be joined today by Dr. Rizwan Sabir and Dr. Tarek Yunus to discuss Rizwan's book, The Suspect, Counterterrorism, Islam and the Security State, which I've got here, and more broadly, the ways in which the often racialized individuals and communities who are targeted by counterterrorism and policing policies are affected both psychologically and socially. Um, the suspect draws on Rizwan's experiences to take the reader on a journey through British counter-terrorism practices and the policing of Muslims. He describes what led to his arrest for suspected terrorism, his time in detention and the surveillance he was subjected to on release from custody, including stop and searches, detention at the border, monitoring by police and government departments and an attempt by the UK military to recruit him into their psychological warfare unit. Um, so, Rizwan will first introduce the book before reading an extract from it. After that, we'll hear from Tarek, a response from Tarek. So this is going to be like quite an informal discussion, conversation. Um, and I'll be asking just some opening questions to delve a bit deeper into the content and the context of the book. I'll then open it to the floor and to the people online for half an hour of questions. So we're gonna to aim to end by like 8.25, if not earlier, to allow for people to browse the reports available and maybe chat to you guys as well. Um, yeah, so let me just introduce who we've got today. Sorry, it feels like I should have done that first maybe, but. Um, so Rizwan is a lecturer in criminology at Liverpool John Moores University in the UK and author of The Suspect, Counterterrorism, Islam and the Security State. Um, and Tarek is a senior lecturer in psychology at Middlesex University. He researches and writes on Islamophobia, racism in mental health, and the securitization of, the clinic of clinical settings. He teaches on the impact of culture, religion, globalization, and security policies on mental health. Um, and yeah, I guess we can start if you you want to start. <laughs> Great, so do you, uh, do you want to just read out, and, or do you want to introduce maybe first? Uh, thank you very much all for coming of course, and thank you for uh, MEDACT for hosting this event and all of you taking out time uh, on this 
Tuesday evening. Um, okay, so um, uh, I suppose introducing the book, uh, the best way to kind of describe it is it's kind of uh, trying to map the connections between the personal and the political and the effects of the political on the personal and how they both intersect, right? Because oftentimes, uh, when a person is uh, subjected to state violence, they generally belong to a more vulnerable subset of the population who generally don't have the tools or social networks or capital to be able to share their stories. So part of the reason for writing the book was to, sh to kind of put on the map to say everything that I'm describing in this text is actually not an exception, it's the rule. The only exceptional thing about it is that I'm using this avenue and, and kind of forum to talk about my experiences. <clears throat> so in the book, I map from the moment I, um, the actual 9-11 attacks happen all the way up until pretty much the present day to explain how um, my experience of state violence have not just had a profoundly politicizing effect, but also a deeply damaging psychological, psychiatric, and social effect because of uh, state violence and the counterterrorism infrastructure. And that's what this book is essentially uh, seeking to document. So uh, Reem suggested um, that I read uh, an extract from uh, the book, uh, and I think we all unanimously agreed that I would read from chapter 20, which is um, uh, titled Seeing Spies. Uh, I'm just going to read the first page to you, so please bear with me whilst I do so, and try not to doze off. I know it's evening, um, but I will try to engage my most um, inflammable of reading voices, let's say. Right, here we go. Uh, it was mid-afternoon when we arrived at Nottingham's main hospital, the Queen's Medical Centre. The accident and emergency department was quite busy, and we had to wait for around 30 or so minutes to be seen. I was taken into a room and assessed by a psychiatric nurse who had white hair, was quite old, and spoke with a thick Scottish accent. I do not really remember much from this encounter or the exact sequence of events, only that I kept thinking the psychiatric nurse was working for MI5. Having returned from Scotland only a few days earlier, the fact that this nurse was Scottish made me feel as if this was a coded attempt by MI5 to inform me that what had happened in Glasgow a few days earlier was not going to stop just because I had preemptively called the police on MI5, left Scotland, or was seeking medical support. The security state, I felt, were telling me that there was no escaping them now that I had found their safe house, and that they would therefore be watching and observing everything I said and did. There would be a price to pay. After the initial assessment by the psychiatric nurse was over, I was discharged and told to return in two days when another team of psychiatric practitioners would meet with me. But I did not want to go back since I did not feel safe there. No institution, in fact, could be trusted. As my research had informed me, every public body is involved in counter-terrorism and surveillance activity in one way or another through the PREVENT policy. PREVENT surveillance, in fact, became a legal duty for all public bodies to conduct with the introduction of the Counterterrorism and Security Act 2015, but the policy was already in place informally in education and health services before this time, including the time when I was taken there. When I got home, I discovered that the psychiatric nurse had prescribed me sleeping pills. <clears throat> when my family told me to take the pills, which were colored blue, I refused to take them. The pills, in my mind, symbolically represented the security state's desire for me to sleep so I could neither be a researcher of counterterrorism nor advocate in defense of Muslims. It felt like an act, active attempt at pacification. But by the late evening, I had caved into the endless pressure my mom and Auntie Sophia had placed on me, and after reciting the name of Allah, I took the sleeping pill. I awoke at sunrise, and even though I had managed to sleep the longest for quite some time, I woke up in a state of extreme anxiety. I felt something bad had happened. But before I did or said anything, I felt the need to make ablution and perform salah. I then went downstairs, reached for the television control, 
and put the news on. Every channel that I flipped through was breaking the same story, the Boston Marathon bombing. I told you something was going to happen, I said to my mom. She looked at me as if she had seen a ghost. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rizwan. Um, so we were just going to hand over to Tariq just to say some words maybe in response to in response to that or in response to your reading of the book. Um, and then, yeah, I can, the, the, it's just at the bottom. Sorry about that. I mean, first of all, I just want to say it is my honor and privilege to be sitting here next to Rizwan uh, for what I consider to be an essential reading. Um, I was given, I think, five minutes to, to, to share some thoughts. You know, if I spend the next two minutes at least talking about Rizwan and the importance of this book, you know, it would be well worth it. But let me just to highlight the significance of this book. As someone, as a racialized Muslim, as a, as, a, as a practicing psychologist, as someone who deals often with individuals who've experienced state violence, it takes immense courage to write and share experiences like this. It is something that cannot be understated. Most people who experience state violence keep it to themselves because they recognize that the very act of speaking out towards the experience that they've had, in fact, deepens the hold that they're in. And this is something that we've seen happen over and over again. So not only does Rizwan have the courage to share his experiences, he has the, also the insight to then embed those experiences within the structures, which are actually, you know, which are actually suffocating him, and then the book then goes one step, uh, one step deeper to provide to you the, the theoretical insights. He actually goes very much into the theory of how the security state operates. So you actually have three different layers that most people would be lucky to actually really only capture one. And this book, in fact, captures all three so well, which is why when I was reading the book, the very first person that I was thinking about was obviously Kans Fanon whom he actually cites in the book as well. And Prince Fanon, you know, he was very, uh, you know, since his earliest writings, he was very pronounced in making sure that psychological experiences are always situated, you know, within the, within the, within the political, within the economic, uh, economical, within the geographical. All these things are always necessarily situated. Um, and to this, I, you know, I think it's always important to also consider from Riz's experience, but also others, what we, what we can understand from something called sociodiagnostic, right? It's, it's, it's a way of understanding and extrapolating an individual's experiences to making sense of the political structures that we're all embedded in. And I think this book does that very well. So the thing that, the two things I really wanted to relate to, um, one was in a way our notion of paranoia. And I think Riz, you speak, towards paranoia in the book, and that, that's, that's, a, that's a theme that, that, you, uh, that you share with us. And I think we're very fortunate for you to share that experience with us. But I think what's so important about it is that it really highlights how so much of our psycho, psychological and psychiatric diagnostics belong within political constructions. So there are certain social political constructions of how we define what is paranoia and what's not. And when I was reading Riz's book, um, you know, I was thinking about Edward Snowden, if you've ever seen the documentary, uh, his documentary, you know, there's one point in the hotel room, he's sitting on the bed and he's about to log into his laptop. And what does Edward Snowden do? He, he puts a blanket over his head, you know, because he's unsure if there's cameras in the room. And of course, for everyone watching, be like, oh, this very unusual thinking. Um, but what Riz does very well is that he, he actually demonstrates that this paranoia, and what's something I like to call this affective surveillance, this feeling that you're always being watched, that you're always constantly being judged and, scru and scrutinized in ways that you know, are imperceptible to most people, 
is a lived reality and specifically is a racialized lived reality. Um, and so I think I want to put that aside, but the second thing is that point where you mentioned right now in the extract, you said, you said that, and I think this is such a profound statement that is, is very difficult for us to capture. You say no institution can be trusted. And you know, I think one of the things that we've, we have a difficulty capturing is the difference between, I'm talking about if anyone here is a mental health professional or just in general, is really the, the qualitative difference between state violence and non-state violence. When, when someone experiences non-state violence, you know, technically the structures are built around to support that individual in some shape or form, regardless of how flawed they are or whatever it might be, right? As politically inclined as they might be. But state violence literally crushes everything to the core, right? Just that one line, no institution can be trusted. The moment one experiences state violence, immediately it has a cascading effect throughout one's entire environment. And I think what's so powerful in this book and why I'm so, I'm so, uh, you know, I'm so happy it's been written is because we can finally just give people a book and, and, and just show them, you know, here, read this book, because this book will outline the tra that trajectory uh, where someone can come to that conclusion and understand, for, especially among racialized Muslims, how no institution can really be trusted once that violence is actually enacted by the state, and I'm not saying an individual acting within the state, these are policies embedded within our institutions, legitimized through the state. And therefore, when a racialized Muslim has a problem speaking to a psychiatrist, speaking to, to a psychologist or mental health professional in the NHS, it's not that professional. It's the atmosphere, it's the four walls. Right? It's literally walking into a securitized space. It has nothing to do then with diversity training, sensitivity training, competence, cultural competence. All of that is completely irrelevant because we're not talking about the person in the room, we're talking about the room itself. And I think this is what's so important in our, in our this is the sort of, um, you know, the knowledge and experience that we need to we really need in terms of our mobilization because inevitably, also as someone, you know, we've written about prevent and spoken about it, and I've been asked a hundred times, how would you improve prevent, you know, things like that. No, prevent is securitizing the NHS. This racialized experience is something, just the very knowledge of prevent is in the NHS is already impactful. There's no way of improving it at that point. So one thing that's very important that this book makes very clear is that we need to obviously repeal any form of policing and securitization. Prevent is only one of them. There's, there's others as well. Um, and to also consider, I think, and what Riz, and maybe I'm going to bring it back to you, um, you know, you mentioned at the end of your book sort of thinking through alternative spaces, you know, given the reality of securitization of healthcare, you know, the sort of alternative spaces that would be beneficial to individuals who've experienced state violence. Um, I think, you know, your, your book really builds up to that, to that climax to say, this is where we are right now, um, and this is the thing that we need. So, yeah, these are my thoughts, uh, but yeah, I really sincerely encourage everyone to, to read the book. These are your thoughts, and my head is about as big as this room right now. You can carry on if you want. <laughs> uh, thank you, obviously, of course, for actually engaging with the book and the ideas. Um, I mean, if any of you have written anything, you know sometimes it can be a really isolating experience, and I actually really appreciate the empathetic uh, lens through which you've read it, and it comes as no surprise, given that you are quite a good human being, but also a mental health um, genius in one respect, you could say. Um, when I was writing the text, it, it was never meant to be a personal book. That's the whole thing about this, right? It started off as, look, I've got to acknowledge the personal story. And it was literally in the proposal that I sent to my publisher. It was, look, I'm just going to mention this in passing. 
because nothing should come in the way of pursuit academic analysis. And then I started writing about the personal story and then the academic analysis and it was just like, why? Like, this is just confining. This is just restrictive. It's debilitating. It's, it feels like I'm doing a great disservice to like this burning need to talk about this experience. But then there was another part of me saying, no, you can't talk about this. Actually, no, don't talk about this because you're laying out your vulnerabilities into the public gaze. How will that be weaponized? How will that be used? How will your enemies use that against you to undermine you? And these are questions that still I have to grapple with today now that the book has sort of come out and, and is available for anybody to read. So when someone like Tarek engages with the book in such an empathetic and meaningful way and can see the broader themes at play, it actually really reassures me that I've not just engaged in what sometimes honestly felt like a really narcissistic, self-centered act of writing. But actually there is meaning to this because when I was writing it, I was terrified that am I just gonna come across as being a complete narcissist who's centering his own experience. And it was only during the writing of the book that after I'd gotten over the difficulties of actually writing this out, and it took me, full disclosure, four years to write this book and it led to a complete uh, psychological breakdown during the course of writing it and it was people like Darek supporting me at that time who allowed me uh, to get through that process and then the text became a therapeutic act within itself and, a, a, and, a, and cathartic but without that support without that encouragement to say look why are you shying away from your personal story get this testimony down with the support of empathetic people who actually engage with the ideas and can see the broader themes, this book would never have happened. So I guess I'm grateful. Um, and I'm, I'm also grateful that you, you've just, you know, like read the damn thing as well. And you, of course, read it. <laughs> and for anybody else who's read the thing as well, like, thank you. Um, thank you, yeah. I just had one thought to that. You know, I find it so powerful that you you say that, that you feel like you sharing your personal experiences will discredit the, significant of, the significance of the insights that you provide. But we see that also, I think, among us as you know, racialized Muslim academics or activists, whatever it might be, that somehow we're positioned as too close, you know, that we can't be objective, we can't be critical, which we often see. And that takes place, as you know very well, it takes place not only on the ground, but in courts and every everywhere, every 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 structure, every place, you know, is going to position that the idea of that being too personal against us. Um, you know, on a side note, I don't know if I ever shared this with you, but when I did my research on prevent and speaking to mental health professionals at the NHS, I always found it really interesting among racialized Muslim uh, mental health professionals and racialized white. Uh, mental health professionals who are all critical of prevent. They're all critical of prevent. But racialized Muslim mental health professionals really spoke in a very embodied way. You know, they were like, I was anxious. You know, I really felt uncertain. It was a very visceral experience. Whereas among many of the racialized white participants that I spoke to, psychiatrists and psychologists, you know, they were critical of prevent, but it was often this sort of like detached oh, this is impacting my professional autonomy, and what about patients, etc. And you, we see that distinction uh, is often, in a way, uh, privileged, right? And it, it, takes, it takes away from a very important side of the story, which I think your book, uh, it, to me, is actually the side of the story. Because if we're thinking about the human rights abuse of this state of state violence, it's not going to come from the perspective of, oh, this is impacting my professional autonomy. It's going to come from the fact that, hey, when these things happen, when the police act in this fashion, it literally destroys the social contract between yourself and the state, right? And it is, it is actually far more foundational and far more, um, far more uh, you know, uh, revealing 
than any discussion of professional autonomy can ever bring us. So, yeah, so I just wanted to share that with you. Yeah, so I, suppose, I suppose theorization is one thing, but actually uh, listening to how these, uh, oh, sorry, uh, listening to um, the voices of those who experience something in a very direct fashion and then can articulate that in a way that is digestible, it always feels more powerful. And I, I you know, when I was actually writing the, the kind of penultimate sections of the book, the chapters where I talk about mental health and the relapses and the psychosis and the misdiagnosis and the labor involved in having to explain why I was experiencing paranoia or these mental health breakdowns to my um, mental health caseworker, I, I stuck to description, purely description. Like I remember I read one book, Judith Herman's Trauma and Recovery, which is a fantastic book. Uh, I'm not an expert in the side disciplines, um, but that book was quite profound, so maybe I'm just being really, really like narrow-minded and it's just blown my head away, but it, it was a good book. And I understood so many things and I was like, I have to stop reading this literature because what I don't want to do in this text is to start over-analyzing, self-diagnosing what I've been through. So I just need to get the testimony out. So people like Tariq, people who are involved in the mental health medical professions, themselves can kind of draw their own conclusions and explain to me what it is that I might perhaps be experiencing or, or living through, right? So that part of the book was just literally just description and testimony, allowing the mental health professionals to, to take what it is that they want to take, but also to exactly like you said, Tariq, that embodied experience of say violence, how the fear of prevent didn't even allow me to access the health service. So the form of self-censorship and discipline came before I'd even entered the health profession, right? So we always think, oh my God, people uh, prevent is securitizing health, thus people go to the doctors and are not telling the doctor everything. Actually, it's worse than that. We're not even going to the doctors because we're afraid that what we say to the doctor may be communicated up the hierarchy to the security agencies. So there's that sense of vulnerability, that one moment. So when you're unwell, it's so damn difficult to say for one word, four letters, help. And when you do find the courage to say help, you can't actually draw on the support services of the health service because of the securitization, which then means that if you don't have people that can help you in that situation, whether it's family, whether it's friends, whether it's community contacts or uh, psychiatrists, psychologists and doctors, you're left in an extremely vulnerable state. And it's interesting because in the book, you see in the first mental health crisis that I experienced in 2013, the, the, the intervention of my family and friends is critical to, 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 to my recovery. But in the second one, I've already developed that network now so I can tap into it quite quickly, which makes me think constantly, what happens if I didn't have a supportive family? What happens if I didn't know people like Tariq and others who were able to kind of intervene and support me? I don't even want to imagine we can we can you know scan and map the potential outcomes. But all I know is in that moment of complete terror, that's basically what it is. It's fear that that takes over your mind. Anything becomes possible. Uh, I'm not going to draw you a picture because it's that fight and flight thing kicking in right now. Um, but there were there were things that I did. There were things that I said, um, which coming to think of it now, pretty messed up. Um, but it just shows you that in that state of mind, you can't distinguish between right and wrong, or what is rational and irrational, because it's all just, it's all broken down. Um, so that, that part is, is a very descriptive part in order to avoid over-analyzing it, to allow people like Derek and those involved in the health uh, profession to draw their own conclusions from it. Um, just what you said there reminded me, later in the book you talk about when you sought help again once you've been writing the book and you found it, as you said, like a triggering experience as well to write, to write the book itself. Um, you talk about going to 
at the time I thought, oh, I wonder if it's Tarek, Tarek who you spoke to, but, and you talked about how you recognised that you needed to step away from the material and take a break from it because it was triggering you too much. Um, but that you had a lot of guilt and anxiety around that, around, oh, I'm, I'm not doing what I should be doing and could be doing for my community. Um, and you talk about going, a, a friend sending you a passage from Audre Lorde around the importance of rest and it being a revolutionary act in and of itself. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that it reminded me of that and the fact that that kind of holistic understanding of what healing can be and needs to be for a lot of people who are oppressed isn't necessarily what you can get in the health service in the in the NHS and as you say you have those networks that can provide that and I guess I wondered if you wanted to speak about that at all and Tarek as well I'm sure you have some something to say but about like what recovery can look like in when you know that you, you know that you still, you know, can face state violence today, and what does recovery and healing look like in that context? I'm going to embarrass my friend now, Dr. Nadia Ali is the person, and she's actually sat here today, so she's the one who sent me Audrey Lord and helped me in that moment of like, just like, enlightening uh, my mind and allowing me to cope with that feeling of guilt, right? because uh, I can't remember the exact quote, and I'm going to butcher it, so I'm not going to butcher it, but it's about self-care being an act of political warfare, uh, or words to that effect. And it was so profound and so powerful, and I think it was the language of political warfare, that actually, when you're sitting at home and recovering from structural racism, Islamophobia, and securitization, that operates on the level of the political, social, and personal, that you resting is not actually you being lazy, but nothing to feel guilty about but it's actually a deeply political act. It's an act of warfare. And I, I think it was just those words that were so empowering, they gave me that sense of, like, I can cope with this. When it comes down to your other point about how do we heal from this, like, honestly, I, I, I don't know. But what I do know is that certain things work for me. And I'm thinking, if those things were to be extended in some kind of formal capacity to, to help others who might be going through something similar, whether it's somebody just listening uh, who you can trust or provide you a, a physical space of safety rather than talking on the telephone about these things where you know that you perhaps aren't being listened to can be quite profound in that moment when you feel like the entire security state and its technology is listening to every word that you're thinking, let alone even speaking, right? Because that's how much it comes to overpower your existence. Just some of those things in, in a way that are centrally organised by people who have the lived experience but also the professional uh, kind of skill set needed to, to help people heal from state violence is, is so important. And I'm going to hand you the mic because I know you've got some ideas on this. I definitely wish I had some ideas on this. Uh, <laughs> not a lot of problems have been solved, right? Um, no, I mean, I think. I, I think you, you guys just hit the nail on the head. I, I, I just wanted to add just one point, which is I think the, one of the main issues we're facing, um, which is I think in, I'm going to make a rather broad blanket statement, but the side disciplines in general are rather depoliticizing. They have a history of depoliticizing issues. And I think this is one of the major issues that we have is that when someone brings in any sort of issue, right? Be it state violence, but it can also be the, the the financial constraints, you know, experienced through austerity or anything else. The moment it sort of enters into the NHS, you know, the structures aren't really built around. Okay, we we recognize austerity is having, you know, is is the cause of this, whatever it might be, and we're going to address that. You know, obviously, it, there's a very deeply sort of individualizing way. Of, of treating things, and I think, I think the first thing we need to do is start politicizing our way of thinking of mental health, and we have to be doing that very, very uh, explicitly. And I think your your book really highlights that, um, and I think it brings it back to Fanon as well. Really, I think your story, every your story, as you're sort of going from chapter to chapter, 
it's not only about recovery. I think your story highlights all the gaps in 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 our communities, you know, be it professional communities, be it the Muslim community, whatever it might be, all the gaps that exist that allow some allow these experiences to go forward, right? Like every step of the way we see, oh here, let's say we know for example the racialized Muslim community in general is very, you know, they're very resistant and deep, like politicizing themselves towards issues of security, right? And we we know that. I mean, we recognize it. Um, you know, but that's a huge gap in the community, right? Like, if, if the racialized Muslim community actually, you know, really took a harder stand and recognized that state violence through security is problematic, whatever it might be, then obviously the trajectory of your book would have been different. But also the NHS. So there's all these different gaps, and I think that's why, you know, I'm so glad you ended up writing it as a personal journey. And that it reads that way because we can follow through and literally just map it out what, what was missing here what's missing there what's the problem with this institution right again socio-diagnostic how are we going to take a person's ex individual experiences and reflect back on all the holes that we have um, you know that many organizations especially med act i think uh, do a really fantastic job at trying to fill um, but I think that's definitely our first way forward. You know, I'm just gonna go ahead and, and maybe just end it on end this small point on a smaller point, which, you know, I'm very concerned. I'm among mental health professionals who say like their work is apolitical. You know, I think there's there's this there's a strand of thinking in general that's sort of pregnant within the side disciplines that you know is actually explicitly depoliticized. Right? Like, like, oh, we're just going to deal with your trauma. Um, but this isn't, I'm not going to take a political stance on this. And I think, in a way, you know, if you just think about that hurdle alone, how that exacerbates the violence towards, you know, people uh, who experience state violence, you know, we, we certainly have a way to go. Yeah. Judith Herman actually talks about this particular, she, I remember she makes this particular point that when we, when we look at how someone who experiences a political trauma, um, it's a lot more difficult for society, society to accept the experiences of that political trauma and how it articulates and expresses itself. But when that same uh, effect is felt after a, an act of God or a natural disaster or a tsunami or something of that nature, we immediately you know, kind of put our lot behind the victims and we back them to get therapy and get help and get support. But the moment that there's an element of state agency and violence involved in the way someone is affected, we immediately kind of bring this ideological barrier uh, before our eyes and, and refuse to see. So it just reminded me of that particular, of that particular point that Judith Herman makes. Yeah. I don't know which book I'm promoting here, Judith Herman, or whatever. Um, but, but it's an excellent book. You should buy both. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, so I, yeah, I'm, I'm completely with you on that. And I think another point that I want to just make here very briefly is that the, the act of saying that you are going to treat my trauma without politicizing my experience basically means that I have to be my own therapist and be your teacher. Because I then have to start explaining why my experience uh, and everything that I'm feeling is the result of politics or unfair politics, and I become the therapist and the teacher, which makes me think, why can't I just sit in a room on my own and talk to the mirror? I mean, I might be like Robert De Niro in Taxi Driver, which is not a good look, but the point is that, <laughs> but, but I, I suppose the point is, I mean, it's not being facetious, right? But the point is that this is laborious. It's hard work and it takes your trust outside of the health service. So it's like, literally, why am I here? This is, this is actually harmful to me because you're denying my lived experience and what I'm telling you I am feeling. So in that way, I would say we, we need to re-politicize um, the mental health and health service rather than trying to treat political lived trauma and reality through this decontextualized, depoliticized lens. Because, let's be honest, 
state violence is deeply politicized. Absolutely. And unless we recognize the politics of this, and that's precisely what I document in the book, because that's what the psychiatrists, the psychologists, and all the other mental health professionals that I met with refused to engage with the idea that I had been arrested, detained, surveilled, and subject to state harassment. It was that there was no mentioning of that. So in my head, I'm thinking, right, I'm going through all of this, and you're not even talking about that. Why, why are you erasing that experience? And I don't think it's because they were cruel people. I just don't think it's in the structural understanding of our institutions to recognize the role of racial trauma and how that kind of expresses and articulates itself and affects people of color. Yeah, so hard to follow that. Um, yeah, I feel like that was like a mic drop moment. But I just wonder, I know I had mentioned to you outside, and I don't, because we're going to open for Q&A in about five minutes. Um, and there's just one passage from the book that I'd asked you to read. Do you, would you be up for doing that? Yeah, do you remember which one it was? Yes, I have it open here. Uh, it's Sharing Our Stories, chapter 31, right in page 181. First part. All right, so this is, this is uh, chapter 31. It's called Cheering Our Stories. I'm just going to read the first paragraph, and it's shorter than the one before, so you don't need to worry. <clears throat> uh, knowledge gives the powerless the understanding, impetus, and means to contest, navigate, and resist power. Finding and engaging with existing knowledge and creating new knowledge by centering our lived experiences is essential. If our personal stories of policing, counter-terrorism, and fears of surveillance are not connected together to form a broader context, they will appear as individual anecdotes that can be dismissed by the security state and its advocates as exceptions to the rule. By eternalizing our experiences through storytelling, we can make visible how security state violence and surveillance is the rule, not the exception. At the same time, through the centering and sharing of our lived experiences of policing and counter-terrorism, we can educate and empower communities by making them realize that their fears, anxieties, and traumas are more common than they may think. In creating and sharing this knowledge, we can move from individual resistance to collective struggle, standing in solidarity with those individuals and communities who are on the receiving end of state violence. At the same time, we can generate the power and critical mass necessary to take on the structures of the security state more broadly. Yeah, I just thought, I think that passage just like really encapsulates what I took from this book as a whole. And I think what Tarek has tried to, has conveyed, which is just how important this book is. I know maybe it's hard to hear, but <laughs> I just want you to know that um, yeah, I thought maybe we could just open up to the floor. I have like a million questions that I've written down that I haven't asked, but I feel kind of selfish just keeping it between me and Tarek. <laughs> um, so I might just start off with one online question and then can take it to the floor. Maybe, so, where do you want to get the mic? Um, but yeah, I'm going to start off with one online question. Would you rather take it as like a couple of questions at a time or one at a time? But for both, it'll be for both of you. Uh, let's take one at a time because I forgot, I bought my right. pen, but I didn't bring my notepad. Okay, cool. All right, we'll do that then. So we'll start off with this online question. Um, let me just see. Sorry, so the, we've got this complex uh, system going on where someone behind the curtain is messaging me the questions online. Um, uh, the wizard. <laughs> uh, thank you, Rosie. Um, so someone had written, does the, so Ben has asked, does the panel accept that the NHS and social care system itself functions as an arm of the surveillance state, particularly for those with high level support needs? What impact does the panel think the totalitarian nature of the health and social care system on the mental health of disabled people and their carers? Yeah, thank you. My hand is an excellent note. Uh, okay, that's an excellent question. Um, does the NHS operate as an extension of the surveillance state? 
actually there's a very large part of this book dedicated to explaining how Tariq said the room is the problem as opposed to the individual in the room, right? And that room is one of militarization of civil society and the public sector, right? So according to that militarization or counterinsurgency, as I call it, you adopt a war approach in order to deal with threats to national security, one of those being armed Muslim groups. So the approach that you adopt, according to counterinsurgency theory, doct doctrine and practice, is to say you need to use all instruments, quote, all instruments of state power in order to undermine, in order to find, undermine, disrupt, and destroy your opponent. That's basically what that thinking and logic is based upon. So the NHS therefore becomes one part of that state effort to undermine the opposition or the enemy or the opponent, right? And of course that is going to have an effect and a detrimental negative effect on um, people with mental health vulnerabilities, disabilities, other uh, uh, problems, social uh, problems, because they are the ones that are generally at the receiving end of these policies because they are considered to be vulnerable. And they're, they're vulnerable to, they're perceived to be in policy terms, vulnerable to becoming future terrorists, uh, future criminals, or people who are open to being indoctrinated by different ideas, uh, anti-neoliberal ideas or ideologies, and therefore need some kind of state intervention. So these vulnerable communities who probably need the most support are the ones that are most likely to experience uh, targeting, vilification, and securitization. So yeah, in, in response in simple, NHS extension of the surveillance state because of the approaches being used, and effects on vulnerable communities and people is more higher than anybody else. Uh, yeah, I don't know how much I can actually really add to that. I think you just said everything. I, I had, I don't think I'm gonna look as cool as you looking at my hand, uh, so I'm just gonna take you from my phone. But I think just to really uh, give more, uh, a little more detail even just to the UK in particular because we can understand how the security is getting sort of encroached in all of, uh, of all of, in all of health spaces, right? And this is something that uh, many of us are sort of writing about, it's happening. For example, the Mon in Boston, there's a mental health uh, hospital there, it's heavily funded through counterterrorism. There is, this is happening all across the global north. I think if we think about how I think it's one thing we need to understand about security as well. You, we kind of have to put it side by side with sort of neoliberalism, with austerity. Then we start making sense of how security is getting encroached. Because if you think about what's happening to mental health settings, think about the waiting lists, right? For a patient to, to see a mental health professional now, what's the waiting list? You know, it can go upwards over a year. Um, but the vulnerability support hubs that MedAct have... Uh, you know, published such a fantastic report on, showcases how suddenly there's a way to bypass all these waiting lists for issues related to security. Now security, now literally police can fund mental health hubs to forward and prioritize individuals that they deem to be more important for mental health support. We see, you see, but you wouldn't be able to make that picture unless you understand the sort of the larger impact of neoliberal policies on, on public health in the first place. And I think there's also just increased policing in healthcare. Like, I think it's something that's difficult for us to even really wrap our minds around, but we've had this conversations about this. You know, there's SIMS, uh, what's called Serenity something model. Yeah, SIM, well, SIM, exactly, where police officers are being trained in two days to deal with patients who are too difficult. So rather than patients now having a direct connection with the NHS, now they have to go through a, a police officer, right? And if we think about, you know, a uh, hostile environment, you know, we think about all these different forms of data surveillance and data sharing practices. If we think about how all these things come together, um, you know, security is one of the fastest growing industries, especially surveillance. Um, and think about all the budget cuts that are happening through austerity at the same time, and you can see how, goal, how holes 
start getting filled. And actually, in my prevent research, you know, people were admitting to me, you know, we're kind of going through with prevent because you know we're sort of we're so overworked. You know, we we my 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 mental health team got cut, and all of a sudden, if there's this issue here, extremism related, whatever it might be, something something looks weird. You know what? I can get this off my shoulders. I can make a prevent referral. They're gonna take care of it, right? And prevent and security wouldn't be able to operate so effectively had it not been within in our neoliberal climate of austerity. And I think this is something that's also really important to understand. Thank you very much. Um, was there any questions from within the audience? Okay, I can see over there. So. Hello, hi. Um, I just wanted to thank you as well so much uh, for coming to speak to us. Um, I think enjoy is probably the wrong word to use for when I read your book, but I found it very engaging and um, really powerful. And I wanted to ask both you as well and Derek actually about something that you talk about in the book. Um, this idea of complying but not consenting and sort of even what that would mean in the context of the NHS so all these sort of people or so-called instruments of state violence who maybe their GMC registration is on the line or maybe they really profoundly disagree with what they're doing um, what it would look like to not consent that's my question that's a very good question and yeah, a very tough question it's very because you've asked it in the context of the NHS specifically. So, so whether you comply with an action or you consent, it doesn't really matter because the outcome is the same, right? So yeah. compliance and consent. Compliance means, oh, I don't really like this, but I'm going to kind of go along with it. Consent is, oh my God, I love this, I'm going to go along with it. The outcome is generally the same. But I think we have to look at compliance as an act of symbolic resistance, um, an act of forcing somebody in order to do something which they don't want to do. And I think that can carry quite a profound and powerful meaning within its own right. So your line manager in a hospital, for example, might realize that you're complying with something, you don't agree with it, you're complying, out of the fear that some kind of coercive action is going to be used against you. And that within itself is quite delegitimizing of the status quo or the policy that's being implemented, right? Um, so I think even though compliance is not going to bring down the structures of structural racism and violence and state violence, right? It's not. But I think what it does is it puts it onto the radar of the powerful that a lot of people are only going along with something because they fear the consequences. And I think that within its own right is something that we can all do on a daily basis in our everyday uh, lives or in our everyday jobs. Also, there's a point, and it's completely gone out of my head now, um, but the point was, um, no, it's not coming. Um, yeah, no, it's definitely not coming. So, so, so yeah, I think, I think we should carry on not complying, but realize that, look, um, it's not, it's not going to undermine anything in the long run, but it will contribute to chipping away at the, the kind of morale of this policy in the hope that we can dismantle it uh, and replace, not replace it, not a bad word. <laughs> we can dismantle it and scrap it. Yeah, I think this theme is really central to, the, to I think many of our conversations. Uh, I don't know if, Green, if you have anything to say because I'm about to go down the rabbit hole, but. <laughs> I just want to, because I was going to ask a very similar question around the chapter on non-compliance and not not consenting, and I just wanted to, um, I just wanted to basically read out the Fanon quote that you had included because I'd never read it before, and I think when I first thought about the yeah what non-compliance can look like, I, I initially thought oh, it's just so small, like such a small act, how much effect can it really have? Um, but I think this brought it home. So uh, Riz, Riz quotes Fanon in the chapter on non-compliance is saying, the duty of the native who has not yet reached maturity and political consciousness is literally to make it so that the slightest gesture has to be torn out of him. 
this is the very concrete manifestation of non-cooperation. Um, and I just think that's important for people to hear. And I think you just really expand on that in that chapter. Um, and there's something else that you say, I remember I wanted to quote something that you said in it, but if you can't find yeah, I think I remember my earlier point that I wanted to make as well, which actually I think is what you're trying to ask. And that was, I remember when I used to get stopped by the police, I always used to not comply, well, I used to comply, never consent. And, and the whole reason was to basically tell them that I was only going along with what they were doing because I had no choice other than to have direct state violence exercised over me in the form of an arrest or just kind of going along with it. But also the Fanon quote, um, it, it, it literally is like to make the job of authority as difficult as possible um, in probably the most passive way that you can. And I think that's what uh, compliance is. It, it's, it, it, it's quite a passive act. It's not radical. It's not, going, like I said earlier, I'm not repeating myself. But yeah, anyway, I'm waffling now. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I think, you know, when you just mentioned that thing with the police, actually, um, I don't remember reading in your book, but this is actually, there's a, there's a research study that I often cite um, with stop and search policing in the United States, and there's a, there was a state um, whereby, it's a very, it's a very interesting uh, sort of empirical study, whereby at one point the police, or for most of the time, the police didn't require consent to do the to frisk. And all of a sudden, they required it, okay? So now you can actually make a direct comparison to, our, you know, now that consent is needed, um, are people more likely to just not comply, right? Or are they just going to resist the stop and search? And Michelle Alexander, she talks about in The New Jim Crow, uh, which is a fantastic book, you know, she's like, oh, lo and behold, when, you know, majority black, youth and you know young men are pulled over and are suddenly being asked by the police you know may i frisk you they're all agreeing to it you know and it's 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 the point i think the word that comes to my mind is coercion right and i think it's it's the, it's a word that we have to be saying very explicitly because there's people um, especially in the sort of security health space who, and I've heard this even from people within Prevent say, oh, you know, everyone's agreeing to prevent interventions. You know, everyone's agreeing to channel interventions, but they're not recognizing that distinction between compliance and consent, right, that you're saying. And I think to you, you, you said something about compliance. I, I, I would only push back to say that I think compliance especially among racialized Muslims, potentially, I mean, I think you speak to it much more, comes from a place of fear. Yeah, right? that's what, I mean, that's what you're saying, right? Like, it is fear. And that's what Michelle Alexander is talking about. Why are all these black youth consenting to the stop and search? Well, because if you don't, dot, 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 right? Like, that's, that's the fear. There's a fear, there's a tangible fear. And especially, I think, among racialized Muslim within the racialized Muslim community, within anything that's security state related, right? Like how many families have I spoken to? Mothers are crying, they're pleading to their, to their children. If something happens at the border, you know, just go through with everything they tell you. You just follow through with everything, consent to everything, right? Because there's a recognition that the moment you stop consenting, it means dot, dot, dot. Right? And in fact, there was that police, um, there was someone I think at Prevent, I'm not so sure right now, I can't, I can't name the person. They actually explicitly admitted that if someone refuses Prevent interventions, that they end up in pursuit, yeah. which is the counterterrorism wing of actually following someone who's actually a suspect. Um, so, the reason why this is so close to me and to my heart is because right now with vulnerability support hubs, we have, I don't know, hundreds, thousands of people being referred to for mental health interventions, free criminals who've never committed an act of violence. We don't know how and why they're being sent to, the, to these securitized mental health hubs. And they're going through with these mental health interventions, most likely all of them out of fear, right? 
And so what exactly is happening here is draconian, but because we have literally no access to this, because it's not a democratic structure, there's no transparency to it, we don't know what's going on, we just know it's a giant racist mental health institution. So I think uh, I'm going to stop there before uh, I get more upset about this. No, I'm, I'm actually glad you said that, and just uh, for, for the theory uh, buffs in the room, the whole discourse around coercion, compliance, and consent is Antonio Gramsci, right? Which is the theoretical framework that I've used in my, in my research. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I don't know how I spoke about the concept of consent and didn't mention the other C word, coercion, um, but the whole theory is that acts of consent or compliance, you know, people only comply because they're afraid of the consequences, right? And whether you're a prevent practitioner in the health service, whether you are a teacher, a nurse, an academic, you report people because you yourself are afraid of the consequences of not going through with that policy. So this entire thing is rooted in coercive control with a veneer of legitimacy given to it through the concept of consent. It's like at a border. There is no better example of this than at the border. If you do not answer the immigration officer's questions, you ain't getting through, right? You will be rejected and denied the right to, to, to board and fly and so forth. So that example of comply or be coerced is no clearer than in that situation, but the whole policy is rooted in that. So thank you, Derek, for actually clarifying that point. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, just another quote from, again, this is something I was going to question you on, but another quote from your book is, for surveillance to have an ability to shape and mould behaviour, a person needs to suspect they may be being watched. And you talk about that quite a lot in your book. You talk about going through borders and trying to behave and act in a way that won't get you stopped or will make you appear to be non-suspicious and then being stopped. And yeah, um, but yeah, I thought that feeds in very well. Uh, any other questions from the floor? Um, over here in the front row. Oh, or in, yeah, on the front row. Um, yeah, I'd also just like to say thank you so much for this one. What a book. Um, yeah, really painful read, uh, but also so honest. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit, and I'm a bit biased here as a teacher, but I wanted to ask a little bit about your, your experience of education. Particularly, I think for me the most memorable bit is quite early on when you talk about going to university and kind of things becoming clearer to you as, as you started to, to well, you, you change subject and then decided to to, to find interest in these areas. Um, I wonder when it first became clear to you that that these kind of structures existed within the world around you. Was it was it earlier than university and and maybe do you reflect back on what your view of the world was at that age? Yeah, that's actually a really excellent question. Um, uh, sorry, miss. <laughs> um, talking to school teachers. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so I, I kind of, look, being raised uh, in a Pakistani conservative Muslim household, we've always had beef with India over Kashmir. So politics was very normal around the dinner table. Uh, and, you know, uh, there was a, an acute awareness of global conflict and issues. The, the Bosnian War, we had Palestine that was on our radar, Gujarat in India in the 90s. Uh, and the, the massacre of Muslims, right? So all these things were on the radar. And I, I was always interested in the news and watching it. I just, coming from a racialized working class background, you went to university to get a vocational qualification to land yourself a job. And the thought of actually studying something that you enjoyed and picking up a set of skills that you could then apply. Because nobody told me that everybody who's in government most of the time study politics, philosophy, and economics. You know, that's not a vocational qualification, right? If someone would have told me that, I would have started not with management, but actually with politics, like I did eventually. But it was only when I started engaging with the topic that I started realizing, ah, actually there's something deeper here. But it was in that moment in the cell when I was under arrest that the entire thing unraveled. That was the moment, I would say, that something happened. And I think it was that 
the, the, the ideological socialization into believing that these are our state institutions, this is the police service, and yeah, they do bad things, but it's okay generally, that completely unraveled. So even in that moment of darkness emerged this kind of, this, this form of education that no book could ever teach me, and that was, life isn't black and white or as simple as you think. It's not divided in a Manichaean way between good and bad, but actually there's a huge amount of grey here, and I think that was one of the most empowering moments uh, that I've ever had in terms of awareness of how the world operates. And it's so funny that, isn't it? Because the, experience, the education actually and the liberation came in a moment of total darkness where I'd lost a lot of hope in, in the system. But, you know, blessings of God, you could say, that moment of enlightenment took place. Okay. Thanks. Sorry. Um, Sorry. Did you want to? No. no. Um, thanks for that. Uh, there was a question up there as well, um, top right. Um, I hate speaking into a microphone. Um, I was just thinking uh, what you just said, Riz, that's like every therapist will tell you, or a good therapist should tell you, that those moments where like everything is out of a crisis comes something like new knowledge or growth like th those moments are incredibly valuable but obviously you should never have been there in the first place um so i was just thinking about paranoia because we've obviously talked about paranoia a lot over the years and i think that actually listening to the two of you in conversation paranoia is the intended political effect right so when you think about surveillance, we can think about surveillance as this like, uh, top-down, ma material heavy thing, but actually it's the thing in your mind, the panopticon or whatever, that you internalise, that you go away and you live with. So all your feelings about, oh, this person's watching me, or this person's doing this to me, they all start somewhere very real, which is, there is something going on here, there is something structured, systemic, a messed up that is eliciting these feelings of fear and like um yeah so that's like that's as it should be so not complying is uh is radical i think because i'm writing the book i'm pushing it out and saying this is not my shit you like somebody has made this and you have to take some responsibility like there has to be some kind of collective uh, acknowledgement of that is incredibly important. Um, I don't really have a question, but I just wanted to say, hi, I'm, uh, uh, I've, I haven't read the book yet, I will read it. I haven't read it for the same reason that I haven't listened to the Trojan Horse podcast, because I can't bring myself to, to do it, but I will. Yeah, yeah, Th thank you Nadia for that. Actually, it was um, quite powerful. And, and I get the whole process of not being able to read this book because it's triggering, right? As, as racialized uh, people who are constantly on the receiving end of state violence and microaggressions, constantly, this shit is triggering. So I, I, I get it, and I, honestly, there is no expectation or pressure on you to even read the book. So whatever is um, gonna help you deal with life, you do that. Uh, actually, I think the paranoia point about intended and un unintended speaks to a really important point, and that is, how do you distinguish between a feeling of paranoia, oh my God, I think I'm being watched, oh my God, I think I'm being followed, with actually having it in black and white that you are being watched, right? So it's a really strange um, kind of dialectic to be in, because you know that you're you've not done anything wrong, you're being watched. But then you keep telling yourself, oh God, I'm just being paranoid. Mm -hmm. Or they're watching, but I'm just being paranoid. So uh, I, I don't have the the, the the psi tools to be able to explain that. And maybe Tariq, you can explain what, what's happening with that duality of paranoia that's proven, or feelings of paranoia based on evidence and just feelings. So a very easy question for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's uh, not an easy question. <laughs> so thank you for throwing that curveball. I mean, you know, it's interesting because the, the side disciplines historically, I mean, they were always positioned, and obviously Foucault 
was the one, you know, one of the main sort of writers talk about how it come as a way of demarcating the rational from irrational, right? But specifically as it relates to surveillance, it's, it's so interesting because it's also highly racialized, you know? Like, I think that there's a point whereby I think there's many people actually in society who do know they're being watched, you know, who do recognize, you know, like, if you want the two, it says CSA is sorted. You know, they're, they're, it's literally like, it's, it's embedded within public structures, except there's a racialized component here, right? And so the, the, the diagnostic step in calling a paranoia is a political step. It's a racialized step, right? Whereby certain people have an issue with being constantly watched because that sort of racialized embodied experience of, oh, being racialized as a Muslim is not great in society which associate Muslimness with aggressiveness, with threat, with all of that, that's that embodied experience, you know, and now the psychologist, psychiatrist, that, that's the political, that's the political spin on it. Is it rational, irrational or not? Yes, you're being watched, but, you know, and here comes all these other terms, safeguarding. You know, the benevolence of, uh, of being, of treating this through a mental health framework, you know, I think there's a lot, you know, there's, there's a lot of layers to work through of, you know, why it is problematic. But again, you know, I just wanted to mention, wasn't there, I, I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this, actually. I think there was like a YouGov survey that found that uh, most people want more policing. You know, most people want more surveillance, you know, to speak to that question. Most people actually, potentially, I think Shoshana Zuboff even talks about that in her book, Age of Surveillance Capitalism. You know, most people want, you know, I guess, and that's how security is sold, right? It's, this is for your protection and many people buy into it. Um, you know, how you feel, like, in terms of just how security and surveillance is just increasing in the world and that sort of racialized distinction you know as racialized muslims you know in in the wake of like the 20th anniversary of the war on terror and we know security is far more embedded than ever before and sort of this normalization of security and policing and everything else on the other side i don't know if that question makes sense yeah no it does make sense uh, it actually does make sense and it's i'm gonna Okay, I'm holding, I'm holding the mic actually in the right position at this time, I just want to pull that out there. Um, no worries. Um, more people want surveillance. That doesn't surprise me, because most people are not targeted through the racialized infrastructures of violence that exist, right? So the majority will want those infrastructures in place. Yeah. I can guarantee you, ask <clears throat> racialized communities, especially black and Muslim communities, do you want more policing on the streets and you want more surveillance? And they'll say no, because most of the time they're on the receiving end of that, of that surveillance and violence, right? So I think that desire for more surveillance and security to protect us from these unsavory, oftentimes stereotyped caricatures, um, is based upon privilege, uh, on, on, on racial privilege, right? So I think that has a significant uh, role to play in in that particular data set, um, so I would say that probably explains it more than more than anything yeah. else. But you you won't get many Muslims uh, and Black communities saying more surveillance. Oh. Thanks. Um, we're not actually going to be able to take any more questions from the floor because we have to wrap up. Which I feel I know it went really quickly, um, but we are. I think we've got like. 30 minutes before we have to like clear out of the room completely. So if you did want to speak to either Rizwan or Tarek, you will have time if you are up yeah. for that. Um, as long as I'm allowed a five minute rest break. Yes, and Riz, Riz will have a five minute rest break <laughs> in between. Um, yeah, and just to quickly add on to that, I think as well, we're not like encouraged to think in a different way to what we experience today. Like we don't, we can't even conceive of alternative ways of living and alternative ways of being in community with each other um, that don't require very violent forms of discipline and punish and 
you know, policing. Um, and I think, you know, stuff like, you know, this book and other writing gives us the tools to be able to first critique and then move past. So again, just thank you so much. You're welcome. Can I, can I, can I just plug another book that really spoke to this point, actually? Uh, and it's a new book. It's called Tangled in Terror by Sahel and Manzoor Khan, Tangled in Terror. <clears throat> and there is a part towards the end of the book where she talks about imagining a new world and that being part of the resistance effort to like imagine a new horizon where we don't live in a world which is dominated by social control and surveillance, but actually is based upon trust, mutual respect, and understanding of one another and our struggles, right? And I think just, just listening to your point about that, about imagining a new future, um, I, I, when I read it, I was quite moved, and it was quite like, actually, why do we not have the ability to imagine a new horizon, which is based upon trust and, and respect and love for one another, and, and the desire to help one another heal? So I think we can, and I think that's part of the resistance effort, but Tangled in Terror by Sahima Manzur Khan is definitely the one to check out, because uh, she speaks specifically to that point. Now I will stop promoting other books. Yeah. <laughs> that, okay, great. Thank you so much to everyone who's here today, or on and online as well. Um, and thanks to our yeah incredible panellists. Please do, so we don't, Unfortunately, I was going to say annoyingly, both have um, the book. We don't have Riz's book here to sell, um, which I feel like many of you will want to buy it if you haven't already got it. Um, but we do have a QR code that you can scan, which is just over there and also outside. And it will take you directly to the page where you can buy it from Pluto Press. And it's got the code, the discount code um, on it, which is just severe 20 um, so yeah, do buy the book. It's just, yeah, a really crucial reading to understand the impacts, how surveillance operates and how it impacts on individuals and communities alike. Um, so yeah, th that's my plug of your book, which is the most important one today. Um, and just, uh, yeah, we've got, if you, for people who are on the chat, who are online, We've put in a master link document, which you'll be able to find some links to join our mailing list, to the reports that we have here today, the false positives report and the vulnerability support hubs report, um, and to our pledge. We, we've created a pledge for people to sign, which is to challenge, prevent in healthcare, and to, I guess, like, just uh, for, like, yeah, forefront the duty of care. Um, within the NHS and, and within the therapeutic relationship. Um, and yeah, the Securitization of Health Group have got some exciting actions coming up this month. Um, you might know that there's this so-called independent review of prevent coming out and we're gonna be responding to that. Uh, just a spoiler alert, it's gonna be a total whitewash. So um, yeah, just be aware of that. And yeah, do sign up to our mailing list. You'll get information about events like this. You'll get, um, the recording of this event and you'll be able to see when the Securitization of Health Group has its meetings. Um, and yeah, if you'd like to get in touch with me or to the group to see how we might be able to work together or if you're interested in like having a training that we can put on, um, you can email me. Uh, my email address is really long so I won't read it out. You can email the office, office at medapp.org and it'll be forwarded to me. Um, and also you'll get my email address. Uh, yeah, and thanks once again. Um, you can also sign up to be a member of MedAct by paying as little as one pound a month. We're only able to do the work that we do through the support and dedication of our members. Um, yeah, so can you just give a round of applause to our audience this year?